Hey, it's BGB from SATX here with James Woodard and Oscar Mourinho doing a gear rundown with their band, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. The Grasshopper Lies Heavy is basically not only San Antonio, but Texas experimental heavy noise rock royalty with over a dozen releases and over a decade of playing around the country and internationally. They've done so many sounds that I find them profoundly hard to categorize, so I'm using their description on their band camp, which you should visit. The amorphous musical giant known as the Grasshopper Lies Heavy defy typical categorization. The band explores varying musical territories while maintaining a common thread. Crushingly heavy wall of sound music, sometimes melodic, sometimes atonal. Speaker shredding, enigmatic, and emotive. And yeah, that tracks. I've had my mind blown by some incredibly rich and dense textures that had me mesmerized at shows, and I've been to plenty of shows where my earplugs seem ineffective and large in-progress mosh pits were only fed by the huge sound. I'm really excited to get the chance to talk to them about their gear and literally anything else. James Woodard is not only a hell of a guitarist, sound designer, gear nerd, and a guru for anything related to being an independent musician, he also helped me find what's now my main guitar and got my gear acquisition addiction really rolling. A lot of credit and blame goes to him. So James, how do you gear? <laughs> well, first, I'd like to say I'm sorry. Um, it sounds like I've ruined your life. Yeah, I, we gear, man. Uh, we do gear. Where to, where to start? Because, so I know you know your pedals, I know you've built pedals, modded pedals and stuff like that. You know, you've gone on about all sorts of amps and you've waxed on and on about your Les Pauls and now your aluminum neck guitars. Where, where does it all come from? Where does it start? Uh, well, you know, I would like to blame fancy guitars or something, but it's really about like the amps and the volume, I think. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so like the 78 Marshall JMP and the 75 Marshall Super Lead are kind of like the, the basis of my sound. And everything I do with pedals just reinforces the Marshall sound. So um, yeah, that's kind of like the basis of everything. And before I had the Marshalls, I used Sovtex because they were just basically like cheap Marshall clones. But over the years, I've like slowly found these two and I got them for pretty good deals. I was just really patient and uh, yeah, it's paid off. Like I, I love these two amps and like uh, the differences between them and their similarities, both at the same time, I think they just pair super well together. Well, so how are they different? I'm not really much of a Marshall guy. So. Yeah, so, well, a GMP is basically like the earlier uh, JCM 800 sound. So, I mean, it's basically like the sound of rock and roll, right? Uh, like every band on earth played these, like Slayer, um, just everybody. It's, it's, uh, it's just like, just like the way the a Ampeg SVT on bass is like this, and a P bass is like the sound of bass rock and roll. Like the, the JMP or 800 is like the sound of rock and roll on guitar for me. Um, it's bright, it's nasty, uh, it colors sounds a lot, so you're never gonna get like that pure chimey tone out of something that's just like a volume beast. Uh, it's preamp, it's just magical. This one's running uh, KT88s, I think, which is atypical. Uh, usually, I think they run like 6L6s. Uh, but Kerry Kings did KT88s, so. But this one, it's more of just like a pedal platform. It's like a volume beast. I mean, this one is has been modded for the uh, it has a master volume mod, so you can crank the gain on it, but generally super leads were just loud as fuck, really. Yeah. But yeah, um, that's really important, and also uh, running them in stereo has really been important as like a three-piece band, because uh, you know you just have to fill the extra uh, missing space, I guess, that being in a four-piece doesn't really have a problem with. 
And a lot of the venues I've seen you play, like the PA is just basically there for kick and vocals, right? <laughs> kick, snare, and vocals, yeah. Kick, snare, vocals. Well, I mean, yeah. Here in America, where sound kind of generally sucks at dive bars, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the stereo thing is really important, but also uh, I kind of use it as a... Uh, almost has an effect on itself because I use this uh, Fender ABY pedal. Mm -hmm. And so for the quieter parts, I'll turn one of the amps off and I'll just play through one and then we'll get to a part that needs to get real loud. So I'll just like kick the super lead on and like blow everybody's ears off. Right. You know, uh, like being able to turn one of the amps off is just like super important for dynamics. Right. I think, especially just being a three piece band. Uh, yeah, just having the second amp like really fills the room. Okay. So you said that the amp's the most important part, and this is, isn't something I've had a chance to really talk about on my channel. Yeah. But I've always used like super clean amps. Like I use the Supro mm -hmm. now, and you actually turned me on to the, doing the Fender Dual Showman because it's super <laughs> clean, super loud, super clean. Yeah. But yeah, the thing is like they don't do a whole lot of coloring, whereas mm -hmm. so I can just let the pedals do their thing. Whereas yeah. now, when you're doing a Marshall, you're trying to make sure it cooperates with a Marshall. Does that affect your pedal choices, or is there, or is it? And I guess, what's your thought process? Are you just trying to make it sound more Marshall, or do you just roll with it? Yeah, it's, well, yeah. Well, both of those things are true. Um, in terms of like pedals to pick, sometimes just shit just won't sound good through the JMP. Like I'll try a new fuzz, and it just won't sound good. But then you stick it through the super lead and it's just like, boom, oh my God, this sounds amazing. And it's just like a wall of fuzz. But yeah, the, the, the 800 preamp just colors things. And so really my main distortion pedal is my preamp, the BB preamp, that orange pedal on my board here. Um, that's basically like my number one pedal. Like if I didn't have that, I'd be kind of in trouble. Like even when we were touring overseas and I could only bring a couple pedals, that was like my number one. Um, yeah, because it just like takes this and like not to sound like Spinal Tap, but it just brings it to eleven. Correct. You know what I mean? Like both of them. Oh, when you were playing with them earlier, you jump in between the uh, Sodomizer, the Heavy Metal, and Creepy mm -hmm. Fingers, and when you turn on that preamp, I'm like, hey, there's more distortion there. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's really like uh, I feel like I'm turning my guitar's volume to twenty. Right, you know, and the preamp is post the creepy fingers. It's post all your distortions, basically. Yeah, so I learned that trick from my friend Ollie in Minneapolis. Uh, he's a he. He used to build pedals for a living. Uh, I don't want to say the company, but uh, um, nice. <laughs> don't 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 hear that. But uh, yeah, he he taught me to put all the fuzzes before the preamp, uh, and that's something I never really did. I always did like the distortion first. And uh, yeah, it kind of like changed my shit up. So I've been doing that a lot. I, I always had a problem with uh, volume drop with fuzzes because the preamp is so loud that any uh, fuzzes after that, it would just be like a volume drop. And that's like the opposite of what I want. Right. So yeah, putting, putting the fuzzes beforehand has really helped with that. And I put that HM2 distortion in front of it too and it sounds great. Nice. Yeah, a lot of people really hate on the HM2, but it still works really well for your thing. Well, you know, well, is there a secret you have for it? How do you like to work with it? Well, you know, everybody, uh, well, generally people use it on the Entombed setting. That band Entombed, you know, they did that, and it sounded sick as fuck. But uh, it sounds a little corny for Grasshopper, also because I layer it for different things, so I usually have it, like, around here or something like that. Uh, it adds, like, a lot of fizzy character to it. Uh, it doesn't hit the mic as nicely as I hope it would. I, I recently just wrapped up some recordings. It doesn't hit the mic exactly like I hoped it would, but it sounds good in the room, which is weird. It's a, but yeah, that one's like a 83 made in Japan HM2 I got uh, just because I'm stupid. Uh, so sometimes the switch doesn't really work very well. Right. <laughs> and now, does the old boss, do you think, sound better than new boss or anything no, like that? Absolutely not. Because boss has all these grades for the, the, there's all these gradings for different boss pedals. Yeah. I, don't, I don't follow it at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think they're planning on doing a Waza Craft HM2. Really? So I, I might get the Waza HM2 and retire the old Japanese one. 
Huh. But yeah, I've been kind of on a, a boss pedal kick. I love boss pedals, and I love, like, crappy. The pedals that people would, like, generally think are crappy, like the DoD Phasor I got on my pedal board right now, mm -hmm. like, it doesn't even have an LED. Like, it's so stupid. And they make a reissue for, like, 50 bucks. Surely you can tell if it's on or not. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said it's, like, 70s in a box, or? <laughs> yeah, it, sound, it sounds just like, you know, like, Shine On Your Crazy Diamond. It sounds great. Nice. Uh, so, yeah, my, my fuzz pedals have been kind of in flux lately. Uh, so the Sotomizer is kind of a, actually a new addition. Uh, so I've, I've been recording, and I just layer guitar tracks on top of each other. So, like, later we can choose, like, the one that sounds the coolest. And, yeah, I've, uh, this one actually just came off the board. It's the Fairfield Circuitry Four Eyes. Uh, this thing is super fucking sick. Uh, I, I feel like one of my litmus tests for pedals especially distortion pedals, is like if you turn all the knobs all the way up and it sounds cool, like I'll probably like it. Right. But this thing sounds great, and it's got a, it's got a frequency knob on it, which is uh, controllable by an expression pedal. So you can have like a synth-like frequency sweep on it. It's super cool. Oh, so does it do like kind of a ring mod thing where it adds in a new frequency? Or? Uh, no, it's more like synthy fuzz. Uh, kind of hard to describe, but yeah, it's, like a, it's more of like a, a filter sweep, hmm. I think, yeah. And then it's got this, well, I don't really know what the switch does, but it says like 1, 100, 10. And uh, shit really starts to freak out when you turn that switch. I usually just keep it straight up. But yeah, this is a super good versatile fuzz, and I actually used it on all the bass tracks on the new album too. Yeah, I fucking love this thing. Uh, like, I didn't take it off the pedal board. I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna go back on <laughs> pretty soon. But yeah, um, the Sotomize are sick. I mean, it's just a one-trick pony. Mm -hmm. And if you want the Sodomizer sound, it's dope. Um, I know Christian from that band Whores uses that a lot. Um, yeah. The Creepy Fingers is a... Uh... Let me know if I'm steamrolling you, if you ever want to ask questions. Oh, no, you, you actually know what you're talking about with fuzzes. <laughs> I'm, I finally got the Behringer SF300, and I feel like a big boy now. Oh, is that the Super Fuzz clone? Yeah. Those are super cool. Oh, and they're, they're awesome, like, yeah. They're like $18. <laughs> Oh, that's why I got it. But yeah. I mean, mode one turned the gain up to uh, about eleven o'clock. Based yeah. up all the way, treble like at like two o'clock. I'm like, that's a I, that's all I need out of a fuzz. Dude, <laughs> people talk shit. I love Behringer shit. Like, yeah. I'm, oh, hey. Yeah. Do you say a lot of bad words on that channel? I'm no, sorry. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll bleep out the f bombs. Okay. But yeah. But yeah, I've had this thing for at least like eighteen years, and it still works. I love Behringer crap. All uh, right. It sucks and it's cheap. Just don't step on it too hard and it's gonna sound great. I, I use the Behringer Sans amp too. Really? I didn't know they did the Sans amp. I thought that was like Tech NY or It was Tech 21, but yeah, Behringer did a little silver Sans amp clone. It was like $18 and like you give $18 sweet, uh, sweet water, $18, and they'll like send you like a Behringer Sans amp and a bag of candy, you know? Oh, yeah. And half of it, <laughs> the reason you do it from them is for the candy. Yeah. Although, when the new, I, I forgot what the, exact, the lines are called, but when they did the new Behringer pedals for 20 bucks a pop, I ordered three of them. It took like three months to get them, though. <laughs> really? <laughs> Worth it. I got the, got the SF300, but yeah, yeah. Anyway. You have to order them one at a time so you get three times the candy. I probably ought to. Yeah. <laughs> think about it. I'll think about Candy it. economy. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, but yeah, so uh, that's one thing I've been curious about. So you got two fuzzes going on on here. Right now. Yeah. Followed by a very head, hairy metal sort of thing. Like, is there like a sort of logic or rhyme to the reason for you have how you have these stacked? Uh, no. Besides having the preamp late, uh, No. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It just sounds good in this order. Did you try other orders or no? Just now, just scrolled with. No, it. I've tried. Uh, I've been. I've been playing around with it a lot, but um, yeah. And I keep like almost taking taking the creepy fingers off the board, but I keep putting it back. The creepy fingers is a uh, brass master copy. Hmm. I don't know uh, that one. The brass master is kind of like a legendary bass fuzz pedal, and you actually don't see a lot of people playing them on guitar. But this one's a. a it's a clone of a brass master. I got this from my friend Gus. Um, but yeah, it's sick. Uh, all the knobs are all the way up. <laughs> well, it's uh, all the way down. No, it's all the way up. It's just crooked. Oh. And this this knob, I don't know what the, these switches do. One's down, one's up. But uh, yeah, it sounds it Maybe sounds like it's really a disgusting. Buffer and or a pad or phase switch. I don't know. I could look at a picture of a brass master real quick. Uh, yeah. yeah, the creepy fingers. I just turn all the knobs all the way up, and it sounds like super disgusting. <laughs> uh, when we again when we toured overseas, I brought the BB and the Creepy Fingers, and that was it. Um, yeah. 
Right, and so when you're playing, it's just power chords or single notes, I would guess, right? Yeah, so we, well, we can talk about this when we talk about guitars, I guess, but we use two tunings. One's basically just like drop C sharp, but another one, we drop the low E string all the way down to G sharp. So the bottom two strings are G sharp at the same time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I use like the really nasty fuzzes on that because it's just playing one note in an octave, basically. So yeah, uh, that's when I kick the disgusting shit on, and it sounds really cool. Awesome. Yeah. Is there anything you really look for in a preamp, or is it just BB B was the one you went with? I uh, no, I I, I tested uh, several. I I the, the, I ended up with the BB and the Keeley Katana. And the BB just gives you a little more versatility because it has like a bass and treble knob. Right. Um, I used to play this thing all the way up too, until uh, a recording engineer friend told me that was stupid, and <laughs> I started turning it down. Do you think it sounds better than that? You started turning it down, or? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, the uh, chasing the tone dragon. Right. We're right. always on the never-ending search for chasing the tone dragon. Uh, yeah, I've I've learned to let the sound breathe more. And um, uh, it, it might be hard for a lot of uh, pedal-heavy guitar players to hear, but the right hand is really important when playing guitar, and a lot of dynamics come from that. Mm -hmm. And so when I want like a really loud, heavy sound, like I'll hit the strings real hard, you know. And so it helps to not have everything else blowing out on there. Yeah, <laughs> and you know th these amps, they have such like beautiful dynamics. Mm -hmm. If you roll the tone on your Les Paul back to th your, the volume down to three, and then you play softly, they're gonna sound like completely different than if it's on ten and you're banging the shit out of your Les Paul. So, yeah, um, if you're using great amps, great guitars, like let them breathe a little, I guess. But yeah, sometimes you want to go to eleven, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes you want to sound really stupid. And I think that's cool. Stupid be meaning soft, soft is stupid. No, just like loud as possible. Oh, cool, gotcha. <laughs> just irresponsibly <laughs> stupid. Yeah. Louder is more better. Yeah, louder is more better. All right, and then as far as the DD7 and the uh, reverb, is that just more for your <laughs> more quieter sections, or is it? Do you ever like layer all that while you're going real heavy? Yeah, at it? I, I layered. Uh, I layer a lot of stuff, like especially when we're doing when we're doing heavy things. Uh, I mean. We're a three-piece, so we need to fill that space. Um, it, it's funny to look at this now because it's like so basic. Okay, a boss delay, a boss reverb, but you know, I've I've been going through pedal, uh, you know, chasing the tone dragon for you know, 15, 17 years of playing guitar in bands, and I've just come to the realization that boss pedals sound great, and they're really simple, and they take a beating. And they basically always work. Right. So you know when you're when you're on tour and like the weird boutique pedal takes a dump. I mean you're not gonna want to like try to. I, I'm not good enough to fix that kind of stuff in the back of a van. Right. Uh, the boss stuff will always work, and they sound amazing, and they're cheap. Like I have like four DD sixes and a couple DD seven just for like synths and all that kind of stuff, and. Uh, they sound great. I love the modulation setting on that thing. It sounds like uh, analog. It sounds great. Well, like, speaking of synths, do you ever try to use any of these on synths? So you just said the DD6 is on your synths. Anything yeah, else? Yeah, absolutely. Or? Yeah, I, I love the boss delays on synths. I have one of those boss Spacious Echo pedals too, like the double pedal. Yeah. That sounds great on synth. Uh, yeah, I've got I've got tons of pedals in, in, in the synth room. We'll take a picture. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Fairfield Shallow Water is another one that sounds great on synth. You run the Juno sixty through the Fail Fairfield Shallow Water, and it sounds like a an eighties dream that you're like barely remember. Okay, I think this is a good segue because <laughs> one thing I've always been kind of curious about: Grasshopper, as I recall, started out being very heavy, thrashy. Well, mm -hmm. maybe not thrashy is not the right word, but mosh pits would happen, and you could hear everybody clear as you could. We could hear y'all clear as day yeah. out back of the venue mm -hmm. <laughs> and get the full experience. So I'm wondering what made you pivot from that to doing more synthy stuff. Like when did that mm -hmm. happen? What inspired that? Because I remember you doing a solo show where it was. Maybe it was a Nord. I remember it being a red synth. I forget exactly yeah. what it was. I've got a Nord. Yeah. And there was a lot of delay. It was very much a droney sound, like a half hour of it, basically. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I love like uh, film soundtracks, horror movie soundtracks. It's kind of weird to say now because like uh, like that's almost like a subgenre of like synth music now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've. I mean, I've always loved that kind of stuff, and like the sound of like the Roland Juno sixty or a Poly six. 
it's just like I, I love that stuff. So yeah, and I, I think they do work together in a lot of ways. Um, I think in a lot of ways our music is pretty cinematic in times, like especially when we do like longer songs and things like that, because we're like half instrumental basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean synth synth is dope. I I love eighties synth especially like the early uh, early digital early FM stuff. It's really cool. Yeah. That's what I've only ever worked, worked with the the uh, software patches. So like mm. I've seen FM. And I understand what's talking about with like modular stuff. I've watched some videos on that, but yeah, jumping into that seems very very daunting. It, it is daunting, uh, and that's kind of why I like collecting the old '80s hardware synth because it's just like one instrument. Like the engineers at Roland made this instrument for people to play, and it's super playable. Uh, yeah, like jumping into patches or like modular stuff is like super daunting. I, I, I don't understand a lot of it, honestly. I'm kind of a, a ludite when it comes to synth, and I just. Uh, <laughs> Boss, or I'm sorry, Roland and Korg are both very good at making intuitive playing synthesizers. And even if you don't understand like the sci the sound science behind it or anything, you can make super like beautiful sounds out of a, one of the synths. Yeah. Nice. Totally. And I guess kind of helps jump into this next part. You told me that the noise swash as far as pedals was something that we needed to talk about. Yeah, uh, this thing has been on every Grasshopper Lies Heavy record. It's the noise swash designed by Dan Green. It's on the back right here. Uh, yeah, this thing is just like so disgusting. It's kind of like a fuzz pedal. But you don't even need to like plug an instrument in, and it'll just start making sounds. That was the next question I was going to ask. Like, it's a guitar pedal. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, sort of. Uh, it self oscillates. There's a self oscillator on and off switch. But even if the self oscillator is off, it will make sounds by itself. Uh, it's really gross. The reason I don't use it like on my pedal board is because it makes noise when it's off right. too. So like even when it's off, there's like a background like noise of like garbage so going it's, on. So it's studio only because it's just too unreliable, life, I guess, or too unpredictable. Unwieldy, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's kind of you know those uh, ZVEX fuzz, fuzz factory. Yeah, I got one, and uh, this is like yeah. the fuzz factory, like that's been like smoking PCP all night. Really? <laughs> like a three day PCP binge? Yeah. Man, just trying to play with that fuzz factory. A lot of it is because I had that in that pedal board that you might remember that was that on that pedal train Terra, but I, I had so much trouble trying to get it to cooperate with me. If you're telling me this is harder, it's like Dungeons and Dragons going to Pathfinders, I guess. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like with fuzz factories, you just have to like hot glue the knobs down once right. you find the spot you like. Right. Yeah. Well, that actually brings me to an interesting point. When it comes to these, once you have your settings, you don't ever mess with them, I guess, at this point? Um, well... I mean, once you're on tour, I, I should say. Once you're in the studio, and that's a whole Yeah, thing. when we're on tour, it stays pretty locked down. Even though, I mean, our last tour was Japan, and we played back lines every night. So I did have to adjust everything every night, because hmm. I just didn't know what we were going to get. I mean, generally, we would get, like, uh, on a good night, we would get JCM 800s. Uh, but a lot of times it was like 900s and 2000s. And I just had to like try my best to make the shitty Marshall JCM 2000 sound like a real Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did they ever give you a Fender or anything that wasn't a Marshall? Uh, the worst experience, I mean, I'm going to get shit for this too, is the uh, Roland Jazz Course. <laughs> what an awful amplifier. Uh, yeah. It, it could be a really good, but not for what you're doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, we'll say that. Um, yeah, I did not enjoy my night with the jazz course. I actually, uh, I turned it off halfway through the set, and I just played in mono that night. <laughs> <laughs> what a letdown. That's just, it goes contrary to the Grasshopper brand, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I apologize to the people of Ochano Mitsu. Yeah. <laughs> Apology not accepted. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back for revenge. <laughs> Okay, okay, so as far as pedals go, I think we got every one of these and... Yeah, that's that's the active board. Uh, I've been playing with fuzzes. There's another one on the ground over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can uh, kind of see it in the shot. Let yeah. me see if I can get that. Uh, I do want to talk about this one because uh, this is a Frost Giant company. Uh, it's, a, it's a company from Corpus Christi. <laughs> nice. Uh, they make a bunch of cool pedals. They're kind of like doom metal themed. But uh, that one's called the Massive, and it's just kind of like a cool one knob wonder, and it does the cool. What evil does the knob do? It's a fuzz pedal, so yeah. Oh yeah, so is it just like a set volume, and that's just how much fuzz you get, or? Uh, it goes up. 
Yeah. Gotcha. Knob go up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't think about it too hard, Brian. Let it go. Let it go. Talking about guitars now. Yeah. And this is one I think I've always seen you playing. Yeah, this is kind of my like all time number one, but I don't gig with it anymore or tour with it just because it's, I don't know, it's gotten sentimental over the years. It's It's been on at least like 10 tours though, and I really used to treat it badly. I used to like throw it into drum sets and all types of dumb stuff, like rub it against the ceiling and <laughs> shit like that. But yeah, uh, the frets are like completely screwed up. You can see like, oh, that shit's yeah. bent. <laughs> Super bent. But yeah, I love this guitar and I still play it. It's like my number one recording guitar. Right. Um, but yeah, it doesn't leave the house. Uh, you know, tone knobs broken off, but no one needs that. Where does this live at, do you know? <laughs> the floor of some bar. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's I. <laughs> it's a 1982, which means it's a Kalamazoo Les Paul, like before they uh, shut down and went to Nashville. So this is like union built, like super cool, like, Classic era Gibson, I would say. Uh, and it's beautiful. I got it for like super cheap because I worked at the guitar shop and it's kind of been like my main for years and years. Uh, it's only been superseded because I got a couple EGC guitars. <laughs> and those are really hard to break. So. Right. And do you do all the same weird stuff with them? Throw them against the drum sets up against oh, the ceiling? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when, <laughs> when we were on tour in Japan, the first night, Yokohama, I broke off two tuning pegs. Oh. And the next day, I just had to like run around Tokyo trying to find tuning pegs for the guitar. Like, I mean, luckily, there's an entire street of guitar stores there we need to talk about one day, but... Man, I tried to find that when I was there, and I couldn't. Like, I, well, I had seen a lot of guitar shops in Japan when I yeah. was touring, but I don't know what, like, where, like, Akihabara and all that's not what it used to be. No, it's called uh, Ochanamitsu Guitar Street. Oh, really? And, yeah, it's just, like, a row, maybe, like, 30 stores. And there's a lot of, like, friendly competition there. So if you go to one store and you tell them you're looking for a particular guitar, they'll just, like, tell you, like, which store to go to. Nice. Well, yeah, uh, we spent a lot of time at that place. Did you get any guitars when you were there? No, I, I got really close, though. Um, I wanted to get a Fernandez Vertigo. Mm -hmm. uh, all the Fernandez guitars are built there, like ESP, Fernandez. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I wanted to get a Fernandez Vertigo, but I passed on it. Okay. One day. I got a question. When you were throw into the drum set, did you ever have the uh, whole neck break that the Gibson no. are known for? No. So that's why I'm so scared now, because like uh, I think like statistically my number's up. Right. And that neck's going to snap off, and I don't want to do that to that guitar. <laughs> have you ever had to fix that? Because I know you've done like luthier stuff and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, when, we, when we were a four-piece and we were on tour in Minneapolis, right before our set, like two minutes before Downbeat, uh, my guitar player, Jared... <laughs> He had a 70s SG, of course, an SG. And he had the he had the case on, on stage, and he was kind of like gently like dropping the SG into the case. He didn't want to bend over all the way, so he kind of just like dropped it into the case. Snapped the headstock off. Two minutes before downbeat. So he was playing my uh, backup guitar at the time. We called it $80 Les Paul. Mm -hmm. we, we played it so much on that tour because all of our shit was breaking. But yeah, $80 Les Paul got us through that gig. And uh, a couple nights later, I... I glued that headstock back together in like a motel room somewhere. <laughs> we had gone to Harbor Freight and got the tools, and he played it like the next night. And how'd it do? Is it all right, or did it ever play quite right again? It's fine. That's fine. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm not Mick Mars. I can't hear it when the headstock breaks or anything. But some people like pre-broke those headstocks. Right. Well, some people said after you glued it together, it was stronger after that. Yeah, like Michael Schenker, I think, would break his Flying V headstocks Ugh. and then re-glue them. I mean, he's Michael Jackson. He can do whatever right. he wants. But. He can do whatever he wants. You weren't in the Scorpions, were you? No. And so $80, $80 uh, Les Paul reminds me. Is that the uh, Japanese copy you told me you had? Yeah. Yeah. It was, a, it was a set neck Les Paul. It was cool. I got rid of it. But it was just like a kind of a Black Beauty clone. Right. Yeah, we threw it around. It, it was a great guitar. I love those Japanese clones, like the 70s stuff, like the Bernie Les Pauls and things like that. Uh, yeah, if you ever go to Japan again, you find some great deals on those kind of things. I'll need another guitar rack. I'm like <laughs> at capacity right now. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to get another Les Paul. And I wouldn't mind getting a Bernie or something like that. I mean, Gibson's name means nothing to me anymore. I mean, right. unless I get a vintage Les Paul, but then I'm not a lawyer, so I can't afford a vintage Les Paul anymore. Uh, maybe you can find a lawyer who got bored with one. Gibson stonks. Yep. Yep. 
So this is the other guitar I've seen you play just a whole lot. And I thought yeah. like people generally look down on acrylic guitars. <laughs> Um, well, the most important thing when playing rock and roll is looking cool. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think acrylic guitars look really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is my other number one, the EGC TB1000S. It, the body shape is a clone of the Travis Bean 1000S guitar. Uh, yeah, this thing rules. I mean, it, it's been on several tours. I throw it. It never breaks. Um, all the knobs are broken off. One knob has been like snapped in half. All I really need is the master volume anyways. But uh, yeah, it sounds super sick. I would say the difference between this and a Les Paul is that this one is, uh, it's angrier. So it's like maybe a Les Paul on 11 or 12. And it's, it has a lot of tonal bandwidth. Like there, it's bassier, and, but it has like this shiny, bright high end. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, I can't say it's better sounding than a Les Paul because there's just like some like magical gestalt with a Les Paul's tone that just makes it sound like rock and roll. Uh, but this is like a beautiful, a tacky instrument that sounds good and it has like a bright, chimey high end with like a, a clear bass that doesn't get muddy. Okay, so I've always been curious about this with uh, aluminum necks because I know bolt-on necks, you know, the fenders, etc. They tend to have a poppier, snappier sound, and yeah. then Gibsons tend to be a bit more rounded out and a bit more kind of even on the sustain. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me this is more like a bolt-on, and that's kind of you said it's got a brighter attack, mm -hmm. perhaps. Well, it does have a brighter attack, but or I mean, a more poppy attack. This I guess. thing is one piece of aluminum from headstock to tailpiece. And it's string through, so like it's like super not bolt on. It's like, it's like the ultimate string. So through. the acrylic is just kind of there to fill out the set. The, the, exactly. The fill out the shape. Yeah, basically. And yeah. what are the pickups on that then? They're, they're the EGC pickups, um, humbucker, wide range, I guess. Uh, but yeah. How much do you think that has to do with the uh, chimey high end then? Because I mean, humbucker is a lot, right? Um, the the older I get and the more experienced I get with playing different guitars and things, I think the the body material is pretty negligent mm -hmm. in terms of affecting tone. It's really about like the pickups and the the construction of the body, especially between you know headstock and tailpiece. Right. Um, things like having like a jazz master bridge are definitely going to affect your tone more than like the wood of the body. You know. Yeah. Come. On. Uh, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, this thing is beautiful and it's a beast. The neck is like ridiculously thin. Uh, yeah. It actually took a lot of getting used to uh, switching from the Les Paul because that's basically like playing a baseball bat, and then playing this, which is like playing like a a yardstick. Um, and another thing that took a lot of getting used to is uh, under stage lights, it is impossible to see the fret markers on this thing. <laughs> so until I got used to the way the frets felt, I was playing a lot of wrong notes. Fun. I, yeah, I actually uh, put like electrical tape. So around. you just turn up the just turn up the fuzz a bit more, right? Until you're comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fake it till you make it. But yeah, I put a electrical tape around the entire neck. Wow. So I could I could at least feel where three five seven Man, nine twelve. Are. I have like a sensitivity to bright lights. I'd be scared of one like reflecting off my guitar and hurting me. Then <laughs> like a laser, yeah, a prism. Yeah, luckily it's not made out of prism, but it's cool. It it the, it, it kind of uh, cues off of a Dan Armstrong, the Ampeg Dan Armstrong guitars from the seventies. Hmm. Those were the acrylic body and wood neck, but they had this Formica pickguard. And I think this was like a homage to the Dan Armstrong Formica pit guards, hmm. which is like I think is a cool. You have to explain material to me real quick. Formica. Formica is like this like crappy uh, material they made in the seventies for like tabletops. It was like fake tabletop material. Fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. and puppy dog duct tape, which has been on this for like five years. These puppy dogs. You may you say might you might say it sweetens the tone. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> if you take the tape off, forget it. It's a Firebird. No, it's not Firebird. What is that? Do you Explorer? know anything about this guitar? Nope. This is a 1978 Gibson RD. I think the RD stood for Research and Development. But this has a, uh, a Moog preamp in it. Notice how big the control cavity is? <laughs> uh, Bob Moog designed the guitar preamp in here. Uh, it's a very unique sounding guitar. It's bright. It's disgusting. Um... 
It does. It has these like fancy preamp knobs, where like it goes from five to zero and then to five again. And so you kind of have to find the middle spot to have like a neutral sound. But if you do what I do, because I'm dumb, you just turn them all up, and it's just like loud and disgusting. Right. Turn them all up. Turn the master down. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> what? <laughs> Everything up. But yeah, um, <laughs> I played this guitar for a couple tours, and it made a couple recordings. I played it on the Mouth Breather cover um, that we recently put out. But this guitar, um, it came from a guy in Kerrville, and I think he played country on it. Uh, look at the wear on the back of this neck. Wow. Uh, but you can, you, like, uh, you, won't, you can't get a camera angle of this. You can see where his thumb and palm, like, rested on it. You know what I mean? Right. That's, like, mad guitar mojo. <laughs> like, this dead dude's, like, soul is in this guitar. <laughs> and the wearing is just so beautiful, you know, and the pick attack and... There's a crack in the body where somebody like dropped it. It's real relicking, yeah. Yeah, like this is like real like relicking mojo stuff. Do you ever? You don't play this guitar live? Or? No, not anymore. It just has like too much of a bright sound. It's kind of like an effect guitar. Like if I want to do like a nasty solo, I'll play it on that. Right. And also, it's just like a Gibson, so I can't get rid of it because like Gibson stonks. Have you checked that shit? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Where is it at? Just going up for oh, it's, the old ones are going up. The but. Gibson stonks are through the roof, man. Oh, if yeah. It's, if it's pre what two thousand, it's the sophomore. I song. would say uh, pre eighty four, pre eighty five. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. That's the real deal. I have a friend who has an ungodly number of basses and guitars, and he goes through the trouble of getting every time there's like a special edition, this or that. Uh huh. I really want to do a guitar and or bass stonk video. Yeah, yeah. Old Gibsons, man. <laughs> That, that Les Paul was probably, I got it for 15, it's like 35 now. Huh. Yeah, real stonks. All right, and this one is another ECG. Yeah, another EGC, oh. Electrical mm. Guitar Company. Uh, serial number 646. Uh, this one is uh, all aluminum. So the, the body's aluminum too, but it's hollow. Right. Which kind of gives it like a... Kind of a twang? A hol like a hollow, like dobro almost twang. Right. You can't hear it when it's plugged in. It just sounds like like a punk rock evil guitar. But yeah, same deal, uh, same pickups, I think, EGC. Uh, but yeah, um, I think the, the hollow aluminum body is like a love it or hate it thing. I'm kind of in the middle of the road. Um, it's lighter than the acrylic, which you would think is better, but it kind of has a neck dive. Mm -hmm. Some people are like really sensitive to neck dive. I'm not because I learned how to play guitar on a flying V. So, uh, but yeah. Uh, it's funny you should say that with the Kramer. That was the main problem. I, that was another problem I had. With you didn't it. like the neck dive? Nah. It's like, hold your fucking guitar, dude. God. <laughs> <laughs> I, need a, I need a hand free for my drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Another thing I didn't talk about is my guitar string gauge. Because we do the stupid tunings, uh, I play 12 through 70s, which is kind of like a 12 through 56 set, but then I have like a 70, which is kind of like a seven string guitar, right. bass string on the, on the bottom. Uh, even when I'm like playing in standard, it's fine. Really, and you do yeah. this for all your guitars? Yeah, all, all, all the main ones I play in Grasshopper, yeah. Wow. Yeah. But your standard tuning, that's... Sometimes it's... Yeah. Well, uh, in Grasshopper, it's a drop C sharp, and then uh, sometimes we drop both of these strings to G sharp. All right. See, it's an octave. So yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And I which mean, one is this? Which one are you touring with these days? And is it this guy? The is clear it, one. Oh, okay, the acrylic. Yeah. The clear one is my number one. Uh, this one I was playing in the punk band. I was in the Sissies. I guess I'm still in that band. <laughs> Call me guys. <laughs> but yeah, this this is a dope guitar. This was a gift, so I'm never gonna get rid of it. Nice. Yeah. All right. And again, super thin neck. Check that. Super thin neck, yeah. Super thin. Oh, geez. How is it so tiny and so heavy? Yeah, so this is uh, my last EGC, the fourth one, uh, because I have a bass too. But uh, this one's a Jazzmaster. This one's different because it is a bolt-on. Hmm. Uh, EGC sells just next to Fender conversion necks, uh, so like 25 and a half inch scale with the round Strat heel. Right. And so this is an originally a uh, Fender body then? Actually, no. Uh, this is a EGC neck with a Warmoth body. Uh, I ordered the heaviest body they had. <laughs> Just for balance. Right. Neck um, dive. And also, I'm not a coward. Um, <laughs> but everything else, uh, Mastery Bridge, 
everything else is uh, Fender USA. Because I wanted like an authentic Fender sound with a metal neck. So yeah, Fender USA uh, pickups, electronics, which is kind of a mistake. Now I understand why like everybody mods the hell out of the Jazzmasters, and nobody has a stock Jazzmaster. Uh, really low output, always has a ground hum, and well, single uh, coil, yeah. All these like knobs are stupid. They look really cool though. Like having stupid <laughs> yeah. knobs looks cool. Oh um, man! Well, you know me and my affinity for switches, but one of my first guitars was a Jaguar, and I loved it. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. But yeah, I just kind of realized I didn't need them as much. Everybody, everybody unwires those. Uh, uh, that's the old Kurt Cobain style. But yeah, it's a cool guitar. Uh, I play it on like uh, clean parts of the albums, and it's my only guitar with a wiggly bar. And it has this long shit behind the bridge, so you can do cool Sonic Youth sound effects and stuff. I'm really a big Sonic Youth fan, which is really the only reason why I bought this guitar. Uh, well, I built it, uh, but it, it is really cool. It's just not appropriate for most of the Grasshopper Lights Heavy. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's made it on like clean interview, uh, interludes on the last couple of records. It is a cool guitar. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, with those combinations, I can do a lot of stuff. Uh, the sodomizer, it works best in the really stupid tuning. I was gonna say it sounded. I was gonna say it sounded a, a bit anemic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so like. Just the way it like square waves up that like, like the initial tone. I mean, it, yeah, it, I think that one's a stacker, you know what I mean? Right. But like talking about dynamics of the marshals, I mean, that's just clean. That's my clean tone, but if I roll back, I can do like. Yeah, you know, I get a pretty clean guitar tone by just like putting my Les Paul to like seven or six. Right.
So yeah, this is the Phasor I love so much. <laughs> I think they, they, they all just work really well together. And this thing sounds just like 1976. Like. Is that basically the same circuit as like a phase 90? It's more subtle, and that's why I chose it. Uh, it doesn't color the sound as much. It's more just like background swirl. Uh, I think a lot of times the Phase 90 can get a little, like, heavy-handed. Right. So, yeah, the DoD Phaseor is dope. They they re reissued it in a blue box, and it's super cheap. I think they were selling them for, like, 40 bucks on clearance. They're cool as hell. And the new ones have uh, LEDs, too. It's so subtle you won't even know if it's on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's cool just for like, uh, you know. Like. Oh, yeah. Sounds too, it just has that like background swirl, you know? All right, what's the craziest sound you think you got on the new album? That's, is it, is it using these pedals or? Uh, no, we have to bring out the noise wash for that. Uh. <laughs> I don't even need a guitar for this. Now we're talking. The things we do for gear rundown videos. I mean, hours and hours of fun. Well, that dooms. Yeah. Yeah, that dooms. <laughs> dooms pretty hard, yeah. But yeah, as you can see, it's uh, pretty useless. I mean, you want to hear a guitar through it? Yeah, I'm curious now. <laughs> what, what, what is the... Uh, <clears throat> how is it supposed to be used? I don't fucking know. <laughs> you have the guitar over there. Like, how are you supposed to use this? But yeah, it makes it on every record. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. So the tape on it, I'm guessing, is to uh, remind yourself what the usable settings are? Uh, that was that was actually on it when I got it. <laughs> 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 I uh, don't have any usable settings for it. Um, I should probably try that. Maybe, someday. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
Cool. So, bass. How do you bass? What is your basing secrets? I'm basing uh, this very nice ECG bass, aluminum EGC. neck, EGC, EGC bass, um, aluminum neck, great sustain. It's the secret, actually. It's, at the, at my, my way of playing is, yeah, no. Adds extra, I guess. Oh. So heavy on the right hand, kind of the grasshopper method is what I'm understanding from James. Yeah, heavy on the right hand, nimble on the left. <laughs> 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 what was it? A dance like a butterfly, sing like a bee? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, there we go. I know you toured with uh, Grasshopper as a videographer leading up to uh, before you took on the bass role. Touring mm -hmm. with them, do you think you really got a feel for what they were about as a band? Absolutely. Um, I've, I've known James for um, a few years before that, um, but even then, like, he just struck, he just struck me as a really nice person, a really cool guy. And along with the band, uh, just, uh, uh, with Mario, he's, he's, he's just an amazing person as well as uh, Steve. Um, I've known Steve longer than I have known uh, um, um, James because uh, he used to play in bands that I used to play with and we used, we used to gig together at times. Um, and so just their character itself, it was just so great to just like be with in their presence and, and especially in Japan. Um, it was actually my first tour experience there. Um, and we, we, we stuck together like family. It was, it, was, it was such a, like a quick connection between all of us. Even though I was here, I was there just to take photos and then I felt like I was like part of the band, just, uh, being mm -hmm. around them all the time, so. Nice. Well, yeah. no, that's good. And that was, uh, something James and I had talked about in the messenger. Like, it's really good to know that you can actually just handle being on the road with someone. Aside from being <laughs> a player, like, being a good hang is paramount to being, you know, a good musician. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Right. So, so I guess, and that kind of leads me to questions. Like, uh, I, I don't want to talk too much about Mario, but I know he was also a pedal nerd like James. Mm -hmm. Has what did his setup influence your pedal choices or anything? Or? Uh, a lot of a lot of what James influenced me more than more like. Um, I never really got a chance to look at Mario's pedals personally, right. even though I was I was around him all the time. But I never actually really talked to him about it. I really I would really like to pick his brain on it because just his tone itself was just amazing. Oh yeah, yeah, he's he's, he's kind of legendary for that. Um, but no, he, we, we would just talk about his basses, like he would, he would like show me his jazz bass and how it was set up, and it was just a really, really nice, nice feeling bass. Right. Like one of the best basses I've ever felt, um, as far as like tact and action and everything. It was set up beautifully. Um, but yeah, that's, that's as far as I got with Mario, as far as uh, um, gear talk as well. Okay, well, then the other part of the Grasshopper Lies Heavy is the heavy guitars and basses. I mean, do, do, are you used to playing the aluminum neck, or is this been... No, this is the first time I've ever played this, like, uh, um, just being in this band. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've handled James's guitar, and even that was heavy. Like, oh, was yeah. Just, like, I'm used to playing just... Uh, I, have a, I have a 64 Hackstrom 1 that's, like, probably, like, two pounds at least. Like, it's just a really... I've heard of Hackstrom. It's just an old uh, Swedish... Uh, it's an old Swedish bass uh, and guitar maker um, that, was, that was around in the early 60s. I uh, have a 1964 one. Um, and you, you can see, like, David Bowie playing Rebel Rebel, and he has, like, a Hackstrom guitar. Um, and, it, and I have the exact same version, but in bass. Mm -hmm. but it's super light compared to compared to this. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, the headstock is just, like, weighs more than the bass that I have. Well, the headstock is the bass in this case, <laughs> right. as James told me. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. So, I, so I know that's obviously different getting used to. Uh, as far as your pedal choices, can you walk me through your pedal setup here? Yeah. Um, actually, I've I've been um, um, using this this compression sustainer has always kind of been with me. Um, my biggest bass hero, I guess, would be Juan Alderete. Um, Juan Alderete from Racer X, Mars Volta. Um, and he speaks very highly of this CS2, and I, when I found it on eBay, I was like, yes, and I, I completely just could tell the sound right away, and it just, it's just one of my favorite pedals to use. Very subtle in, in its tone, but it's really cool. I originally got this Rat, because um, I didn't really have any distortion pedals. Um, anything that's, that's distorting was more like the Big Muff that I've always had, um, but this is actually one of my first distortions that I've ever owned, um, which is... Really, really cool. I like the sound of it. And the Big Muff, it has like that warm, um, that warm fuzz tone on there. Um, and the digital delay, like I come from a 
kind of psychedelic background, so I always use the warp on this at times. Um, and then just uh, as a temporary, I have this reverb. I'm planning on getting a better reverb, but this 63 Fender is, um, is kind of getting the job done for now. Yeah, it's that kind of spring reverb sound though, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it does. Wait, so this is a DD3? DD6? A DD6. I'm seeing that the mode knob on there is different. Is it a mod or is that a fix? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, so what happened is, uh, while I was playing with another band, um, I, I don't know what happened, that the, that the pedal fell or I threw it. I'm not sure what happened, but the, 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 the knob just like tore off and they needed a quick fix, so I had a, I had an old Ibanez, uh, I had an old Ibanez delay. You know, the silver ones with like the push, like you can push the, the knobs in. Um, and I just took that apart and like soldered it together and it kind of, uh, it kind of created this weird, uh, uh, I mean, it works, but uh, <laughs> it's kind of a, you, you can push, you can push down the knob and it, I don't, I don't know what it doesn't do anything, but. Oh, you know, well you pushed it down, it, there was a ground hum, did you hear that? I think that was the AC. No, I think that was the AC. Oh. <laughs> no. Dang it. I thought I... <laughs> yeah, I was like, wait a second. I thought I had a gotcha moment in YouTube journalism. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, no. It's just, uh, I guess, to like keep the pedals from, like the knobs from moving. Cool. Do you have any parts where you have it all rolling at once for the, the true dooming? Uh, not as of yet. Maybe on one of the songs um, I'm starting to, but... Um, yeah, mainly is either all uh, all distortions on and the compressors or uh, the digital delay and the reverb um, kind of goes into two different categories. When it starts getting the uh, when the sound starts getting uh, um, slower or like the more uh, ominous parts of the song. Okay, and this is all going into. Can you explain the uh, the Antifa uh, head behind me? Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> I, I I saw it and I loved it. You know, <laughs> like I, I, I it was it was Fender when I first saw it, but I saw the anti anti fascist and I'm like I'm down. This is cool. This is what we need. This is what we need. We need an anti fascist brand. Uh, this is a this is a Fender basement. I'm not sure the uh, basement uh, the basement 300 um, has those five tubes in the back, super, super mighty sound. I have this fridge cabinet, um, and pick eight by 10, but it's a little bit goes a very long way. I learned that. Oh, it just it has never, to go loud. We turned it up from one to two and it was just a world apart, man. Yeah. I'm scared of 10 on there. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's the loudest, uh, it's the loudest head I've ever played out of. Um, cause I'm used to playing out of Ampeg. I have an Ampeg four, 450, um, as my main, but that's, this is by far the, the biggest, beefiest right. tone that I've ever gotten. Maybe you can tell me, so uh, I'm gonna move back over here. So Ampeg versus Fender, I've not really played Ampeg a whole lot. Uh, I played, I played a, I played, like my first amp was a Fender, as a, as a Fender basement, I think is the, this is the 100 watt with the glow on the bottom. Um, that was my first amp and I absolutely loved it. And then I, I switched over to Ampeg once I started getting, I think Fender or Ampeg, I would say Fender. Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of changed my world. Um, but I haven't really tried any of the high-end Ampex. So, right. I mean, there's there's that bias there. I got so, you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, so as far as playing time, what's the wickedest sound you got now of this whole setup? Or what's your favorite thing to play with Grasshopper? Um, I like, uh, it's the uh, the album titled um, Cult of Worships, A God of Death. has a lot of uh, chord progressions on the bass, and it's just really... You kind of go off on all the pedals, and it's this this song that I that I do both the the reverb and delay, and as well as the all my uh, all my fuzz is there at the same time. Um, but yeah, I think I think that song is going to be the my top one of the album. Oh, okay. Can you play through a chunk of it, or I guess go just skip to the big part? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a part that's like more. Uh, yeah, it, it, like none of it makes sense. Yeah, it does. Part. Yeah. <laughs>
Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, one thing that always throws me off with all of the fuzzes is like it's really hard to like, even when you're just hitting that low, that A, I guess it's an A to me, I don't know what's actually tuned to. Would you say it was tuned to a G sharp? G sharp. G sharp. Yeah, like when you're playing it, I feel like I'm hearing a couple different notes there, mm-hmm. and that's just what happens when you stack fuzzes on top of each other. Right, yeah, it, it kind of overlaps sometimes. Um, but yeah, it's a, I mean, I guess the louder you play, the, the better um, it kind of sounds. I guess it like it's kind of like turning on the radio in your car and your car's broken down. You kind of ignore all the other parts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this is a. So, so I love I love playing in this band. This is really good. Nice. I think it sounds pretty dope with like just the rat and the compressor. Yeah. I think that might be my. Yeah, I think that's a. <laughs> So, cool. Uh, well, really glad I got to pick your brain on your rig. I really want to get more into bass pedals again. I just, yeah. I've just i gotten so spoiled with Pro Tools and a DI, like <laughs> I need to actually play bass live again. Right. <laughs> but, cool. Uh, it, I think that's it. James, do you have any thoughts on the bass that I might have missed out on? Any cool points? Uh, no, I mean, yeah. I, I feel like we're just getting started with Oscar and the band, so. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm very green in this uh, in this style. We're we're still trying to like hone in the bass tone with the guitar and all that. So. Right. Well, then I gotta ask. Uh, any pedals you're planning on getting to expand the sound palette on here? A better reverb for sure. Um, maybe switch this out the big muff for a better muff or a better fuzz. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I really once I I saw the rat and I was like, well, this is I can this is a very affordable pedal, so. Now I'm starting to look into like more like wow, distortion is pretty cool. Like let me let me try something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it just it just opened up a Pandora's box for me um, of things that I can I can get. Can't wait though. Well, you're not set until you have three fuzzes. I don't think. Yeah, right. I think, yeah. I think that's the rule. How many fuzzes do you have, James? Like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the gear rundown with the Grasshopper Lies Heavy. Big thanks to Oscar and James, not only for letting me interview them, but also for helping me out through the litany of technical issues we had. We had cameras failing. I forgot my recording interface. It was a mess, and uh, without them helping on that aspect of two, I couldn't have made this come together. So thank you a lot for helping me with all of that. The Grasshopper Lies Heavy has its new album, A Cult That Worships a God of Death, coming out on July 17th. It'll be on the Spotify, on the SoundCloud, on all of the places. There will be a link in the description once it's out. Also, be sure to check out their new music video on James Woodard's channel, which I'll also be linking. When they start touring again, if they go to your neck of the woods, I highly suggest you check them out. It's a show that you will not forget. Also, James and Oscar are cool dudes. You can totally talk with them about gear and stuff. In the meantime, drop a comment, give us a like, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon. Do all the things, please, as we keep this going. And let me know if you want to see more videos like this. I certainly know other bands. And yeah, thanks for watching. See y'all later.